Hey there! I'm author Sarah A. Chrisman, and today I'm going to talk to you about solar eclipses in the Victorian era. In Sparks Press, book seven of the Tales of Chetsumoka, there's a scene where Felix interviews our lady scientist, Ethel, about an upcoming eclipse so that he can write about it for the newspaper. Now, people in the Victorian era got excited about eclipses, just like they get excited about eclipses today. And quite frankly, people have always been excited about eclipses. They're really cool. Uh, people have been able to predict them far longer than a lot of folks realize. In fact, <laughs> over 4,000 years ago in China, it was just so absolutely taken for granted that of course you could predict eclipses. That when uh, the Emperor Chung Kang failed to be notified that there was an eclipse coming in 2158 BC, so 2158 BC, <laughs> When no one told Chung, Emperor Chung Kang that an eclipse was coming, he got so upset about it catching him unaware that he had two of his officers of state executed. Because, of course, they should have told him about the upcoming eclipse. <laughs> now, to be fair to him, there are a lot of reasons why a monarch wants to know about an eclipse. Biggest one, of course, is that the peasantry tend to get very, very nervous when the sun suddenly disappears. And seditionists often take it as a convenient excuse to say, well, maybe we should do away with the ruler right now because it's a bad sign that it's a sign he's doing a bad job. So, Ian, to be fair, he, he really did want to know. He had good reason for wanting to know. <laughs> uh, I feel kind of bad for this folks who had it executed, but yeah. Anyhow, uh, luckily, I'm told that for people who are very, very good at advanced math, not me, uh, <laughs> it's fairly straightforward to predict eclipses. For people who are very, very good at advanced math, that's not me. Uh, the equations are far over my head, but luckily I don't, I don't work full time for a monarch and no one's going to chop my head off if I fail to carry a one or drop a two now and again. Besides the usefulness of eclipse predictions to monarchs, for hundreds of years eclipses were also very useful to the navies of various countries. Although precise observation of an eclipse wasn't possible on the rolling and pitching deck of a ship, the observations made on land allowed the makers of nautical maps to correct longitude and perfect their knowledge of the moon's place relative to the stars. In the days when sailors relied on accurate astronomical charts to help them steer by sun, moon, and stars, this knowledge was vital. Now, I should point out that although uh, various partial phases of eclipse can last, oh, two hours or more, totality, that's when the sun is completely covered by the moon, it only lasts uh, about three minutes or so on average. So. Anybody who wants to observe an eclipse really has to do a lot of planning ahead of time. And for a long time, yes, for a long time, people planning eclipse expeditions would use nautical maps to plan exactly when and where they wanted to go. But by the late 19th century, scientists were creating their own eclipse maps. And knowledge built upon knowledge. Uh, the math was advanced enough by this point to not just predict when an eclipse... You have your own input? Okay. The math was advanced enough by this point to not just predict when an eclipse would occur, or, yeah, not just predict when an eclipse would occur, but exactly where, the exact path of totality. So, things really sped up. And there were a lot of things contributing to that increase in speed in this knowledge. There was empire, 
And no matter how you feel about empire, it's really hard to deny that empires facilitate the movement of goods, services, and people. That's what empire does. It's one of the big reasons that cultures have empires, and that goes whether you're talking about ancient Rome or the British Empire that was so powerful in the Victorian era. Also, there were huge advances in technology. Now, that was everything from steamships and trains that helped people get to the eclipse locations, and also the really high-tech equipment that was being used to study the eclipses themselves. And I'm going to get back to that in a minute because it's really amazing. <laughs> um, besides empire and technology, another thing that goes along with all this, and this really ties into empire, is infrastructure. Big infrastructure. We don't have the Panama Canal yet in the Victorian era. That won't open until 1914. But we did have the Suez Canal as of 1869. And that made travel to India a lot faster. And also there was the infrastructure of roads and railroads, because if you've got trains, you need tracks for them to run on. And those don't make themselves. So there was this huge building of all of these things that came together, and it created this cumulative effect that really sped up knowledge and sped up the ability to study things. Near the beginning of the Victorian era, there was one particular eclipse that was incredibly influential in eclipse study throughout the rest of the 19th century, and that was the eclipse of July 8th, 1842. And uh, the wife of an Amherst astronomy professor named Mabel Loomis Todd, that was the wife, not the, not the husband, she declared that the eclipse of 1842 marked the golden age of physical research upon the sun. And I'm going to get back to the 1842 eclipse in a minute, but first I'm going to tell you a little bit about Mabel and explain why she was important. Because, quite frankly, I couldn't have made this video without her. Now, uh, Mabel helped her husband David with his astronomical studies. Here's a picture of them, by the way. So he was the... Thank you, Bastet. <laughs> she just took a flying leap onto my back. Um, so here is Mabel's husband David, the astronomy professor, and here's Mabel herself. And so she helped him with his astronomy research. She went with him on his eclipse expeditions all around the world, including two eclipse expeditions to Japan that I'm going to tell you about in a minute. And she wrote books for the general public about eclipses. Now, most astronomy books are incredibly high-level math, incredibly high-level physics, incredibly high-level chemistry. That's how astronomers write. That's how the, the really hardcore academics write. Mabel wrote books for the general public. So she wrote books for you and me. And in fact, two of her books were really important for me writing, for me doing this video. Uh, there was Corona and Cornet, which I've got over there, but I don't think that's going to let me uh, break it off, bring it out to show you. Corona and Coronet was one of Mabel's books, and also Total Eclipses of the Sun. Corona and Coronet is about one of their expedition, expeditions to Japan. Total Eclipses of the Sun is a history of eclipses ever since people were keeping track of eclipses up until she wrote it uh, around the turn of the 20th century. Um, so she made astronomy accessible for the masses. She was really important that way. She was also important because without Mabel, we probably probably would have never heard of Emily Dickinson. Now, I know I just did a big switch from astronomy to poetry, but it's all connected, so bear with me. At the same time that Mabel was married to David, following him around the world to watch eclipses, helping him with his research, writing her own books about eclipses, um, and, oh, just incidentally painting flowers in her spare time. She was actually a really amazing artist. Just incidentally. At the same time she was doing all that, 
she was also carrying on a rather torrid love affair with Emily Dickinson's brother, Austin. <laughs> and I've got a picture of him, too. Uh, there they are. So, there's Mabel again. And there's Emily Dickinson's brother, Austin. Those two were an item. Now, Emily Dickinson was a rather notorious shut-in. She wasn't big on trying to get her work published at all. That wasn't her thing. Um, when she died, her poetry, this is actually a book of photographs of Emily Dickinson's poetry as it was when she died, when she left it behind. It's all just these scribblings on envelopes and scraps of paper that she left behind. No real organization. And it was Mabel that actually went through all of these because you can't send these to a publisher. They would just throw them in the waste bin. Um, Mabel was the one who actually went through all of these scraps and transcribed them all and got them published. So Mabel was responsible for getting Emily Dickinson's work published. And if it wasn't for Mabel, we probably would, have, would not have heard about Emily Dickinson. Remember Mabel, because she's going to come up again later. But first, let's get back to the eclipse of 1842. The eclipse of July 8, 1842 was important because of where its path of totality crossed. That's the place where you can fully see the sun eclipsed by the moon. Now, usually the sun, well, ever, the sun doesn't care where its shadow is falling when it goes into eclipse. And the world is a densely populated place, but it's densely populated very selectively. People don't tend to live on top of the ocean. Sure, they cross it in ships, but they don't live there. Deserts are pretty sparsely populated. Uh, jungles are pretty sparsely populated. But in 1842, the eclipse went right across some of the most densely populated places in Europe. That included southern France. <coughs> Excuse me. It went across northern Italy, it went across Germany, and into Russia. Now, if you're talking about a lot of people, Russia's up there in terms of countries with a lot of people. This is a lot of cities seeing an eclipse. And so it really sparked an interest that created a fire of just fascination with eclipses. And that's why Mabel considered it a turning point in eclipse research. And also there was a lot of amazing technology coming out and about to be developed to study eclipses. 1851 was the first time someone managed to photograph an eclipse with a daguerreotype camera. And then in 1860, a photographer named Warren Delarue managed to photograph an eclipse with heliography and collodion plates. For those of you who've read Sparks Press, collodion is the photography chemical that made Bump so woozy and got him his nickname. Uh, back to the eclipses, once photographers had proved that it was possible to take pictures of an eclipse, there was a push for more and more eclipse photography in finer and finer detail, and that meant more equipment. By 1896, when the Amherst expedition led by Mabel's husband David went to Japan for the second time, they had equipment that could take between 400 and 500 photographs in just two and a half minutes. Their cameras, and also the movement of their huge telescopes, was con were controlled by something called an electric commutator. This looked a bit like a music box and functioned something like the barrel of a player piano. Instructions were coded by a punch system on a long ribbon of paper. Here's an example of what a portion of that would have looked like along with the corresponding instructions. As the paper traveled over the barrel, the pins would interact with the punched paper to take pictures. Say that five times fast. The pins would interact with the punched paper to take pictures. <laughs> they'd move telescopes, and they'd carry out other instructions as well. This 1896 version used by Mabel's husband ran off electricity. There was an earlier pneumatic version that I'll go into in the next video, when I'll show you more cool equipment and also explain the role of an eclipse in the real story of Anna and the King of Siam. Always a bright time, shadows 
must pay that dog.